two very different scenes inside and outside Queen's Park as the legislature starts its fall sitting. The threat of striking teachers is just a few steps away. It's just the first day back after nearly five months off and Doug Ford is in the spotlight after laying low during the federal election campaign. This time a bit of different tone though than in the past year. Lisa Shing is live from Queen's Park. So Lisa, what can we expect from this sitting? Well, definitely a much friendlier tone if today was any indication, Dwight. Uh, MPPs were much less combative, uh, definitely less heckling during question period as well. Uh, and MPPs were also much more polite to each other during the first sitting since the federal election, although the scene outside was a lot different earlier today. Labour protesters welcomed MPPs back to Queen's Park after a five-month-long break. Inside the House, a much more cordial tone during question period than before, including from Premier Doug Ford. I called the Prime Minister and offered my congratulations to the Prime Minister and told him, I understand politics, let's get down to work now. Incidentally, a new bill tabled today will cut red tape for food rescue programs, soup kitchens and school nutrition programs, which are currently held to the same standard as restaurants. But there's still pressure on the government. Ford took heat over changing the cap on class sizes again, which is a sticking point in teacher negotiations. They say they're trying to reset, uh, but what they do need to do is, is reset the cuts. And the premier got questions on why the progressive conservatives are not dropping the carbon tax court challenge, which the premier hinted at doing before the federal election. We have a great plan. We have a great environment plan. The whole rationale around fighting the carbon tax is as phony as the $15 billion deficit. While Ford still got lots of applause, MPPs only rose for one standing ovation, a marked departure from the previous sitting. I thought the tonal shift today was, was a good sign, and I hope it continues. People were universally upset at the tone that they, heard, that they saw, and they universally have said enough. Uh, disagree, argue and fight, but work together to advance the agenda of uh, the people of Ontario. So we're going to do that. So tough to tell uh, how long this tonal change will last. The government certainly has uh, several challenging tasks ahead, uh, including revamping the autism program, capping public sector wage increases at 1%, and most immediately uh, negotiating contracts with teachers, uh, which has seemed to have a lot of tension so far. Dwight. Thank you for that, Lisa. Let's bring in our Queen's Park reporter now, Mike Crawley, to dive deeper into some of the big issues facing the Ford government. Mike, let's start with the biggest one, teacher talks. How big of a concern is this for the PCs right now? Well, Dwight, this is absolutely job one for the Ford government. There are four big teachers' unions involved in the negotiations right now. The sides are apart by hundreds of millions of dollars, and there's the prospect of a strike by high school teachers in the public system as early as November the 18th. So getting a deal or getting deals on all four of these uh, sets of negotiations without any labor disruption, that is going to be by far the biggest challenge facing the Ford government in the coming weeks and months. One of the most ambitious promises the government made last year was ending hallway medicine. How is that file progressing? Well, the latest figures show that it is not getting any better. Uh, there is a big bottleneck in the health system on the hospital wards, and people feel that all the way down in the emergency rooms. That's because people who get admitted to hospital through the ER, they're waiting on average more than 15 hours in the emergency room to be able to get a bed on a ward, and that is an average of 15 hours. So the government's creating these things called Ontario Health Teams to uh, try to deal with this problem. We're expecting that the first of these is going to be announced any time now in the next few weeks, but it will take a while before they actually have any effect on the hallway medicine problem. There are also a number of big decisions facing this government. Can you run through some of them for us? Yeah, there's a pretty lengthy to-do list that the Ford government has. Uh, First of all, there's some decisions that they've got to make on whether to expand retail sales of alcohol in particular. Are they going to be able to make good on their promise to allow corner stores across the province to sell beer? Uh, the government's looking at undoing some controversial changes they made to the autism therapy program. Uh, they've got to decide who will be the winning bidder to 
redevelop Ontario Place. And uh, Doug Ford has hinted that there's some sort of financial help coming for new home buyers. So lots to watch for. Okay. It was around this time last year we first got a sense of the cuts we've been talking about for months. What should we be looking for in next week's fall economic statement? Yeah, the fall economic statement is a kind of mid-year fiscal update. It's going to be delivered on uh, Wednesday of next week. So for the Ford government, it provides another opportunity to try to send a new message. They, after all, have a new finance minister in Rod Phillips. So look for him to give a new lower deficit number. And if this false statement has a lot less cutting than there was in last year's false statement or in the spring's budget, that could be a signal that uh, the Ford government and the PCs have learned their lessons from uh, some of the mistakes they made in the first year. Lots to look forward to in this session. Thank you for breaking it down for us, Mike. Okay, Dwight. Usually when I go to the bank, I'm dressed in warm business attire, um, but this time I went in with my hoodie and my toucan and obviously a 6'4 black guy, right? A licensed hemp farmer says after a recent trip to TD Bank, they froze his account and accused him of engaging in illicit activity. He alleges they made assumptions based on his appearance. His story coming up later in the show. A 74-year-old man has died after being hit by an SUV this morning in the Flemington Park area. Police say the man was crossing Eglinton at Don Mills just after 6 a.m. when he was struck by an SUV. The driver was making a right turn at the intersection and remained at the scene. You can see lots of construction also at that intersection. The victim was taken to hospital and died hours later. Police have not released his name. Later this morning, a second pedestrian was killed on Toronto streets. An 83-year-old woman died after being struck by a van near St. Clair and Runnymede. She was crossing the road with another woman just after 10 a.m. when they were hit. Investigators say the pair did not cross at a proper intersection. The driver remained at the scene. The victim died in hospital. The other woman was treated for serious but non-life-threatening injuries. The alleged victim in the College Street Bar Gang sex assault trial is back testifying today. She appeared via video from another room in the same courthouse as the two accused men. Lorenda Redekop has more from the courtroom now and a warning. Details of this story are graphic and may be disturbing to some viewers. Eight security cameras inside the College Street Bar captured hours of sex acts between the alleged victim, the bar's owner, Gavin McMillan, and manager, Enzo de Jesus Carrasco. She had arrived at around 7.30 that evening to see her friend, who was a new hire in training. The jury and media have seen the most graphic images, but that part of the tape has not been released. Other parts show her stumbling at times, appearing to do cocaine, and being touched by the men. She said she remembers having five drinks and willingly doing two lines of cocaine. She says both accused raped her. Then when she was leaving after 5 a.m., she says De Jesus jumped in her cab, took her to his place and raped her again. Both are pleading not guilty. The woman says in the hospital the next day, she felt more pain and saw bruises that looked like finger marks on her arms and upper thighs. The Crown asked, do you remember your arms being grabbed? I don't remember that. Do you remember how the bruises on your thighs happened? No. The now 27-year-old says she still suffers from lockjaw and knee problems after that night. She says her boyfriend at the time looked through her phone and found video and pictures from that night. She said she deleted them. The reason? He got really mad and he left for almost a week and I panicked, thinking he wouldn't come back. But then she called police to tell them. Once again, she said, I panicked. On cross-examination, the lawyer for Gavin McMillan, Sean Robichaux, suggested she asked to be filmed and was consenting. Isn't that why you deleted the video? No, she said. Robichaux told her she wanted a threesome with them. What I'm going to put to you is that you do have a reasonably good memory of that evening and particularly the sexual activity, saying it was forceful but consensual. She responded it was not consensual at all. He asked if she remembered the phrase polyamorous coming up that night. She responded in a flat tone to each suggestion, no, and said, I was in a monogamous relationship. Robichaux suggested she said she was a bad little girl and wanted to play the role of a submissive. Very much disagree with that, she said, because I would never do that. 
It will be up to the jury to decide which version of events it believes. The cross-examination continues tomorrow. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Over the weekend, the mayor of Brampton called for more surveillance along two highways in Peel Region, saying the closed-circuit cameras will help curb gun violence in the area. TV cameras are integral to, to have. We've seen gang activity from Toronto spill over into the 905, and unfortunately, they're utilizing right now the 403 and the 410 for targeted shootings. Mayor Patrick Brown wants to install 64 cameras that will cost around $3 million. But at a time when privacy concerns are at an all-time high, more surveillance may raise some red flags. If the police, for example, have probable cause that some crime has been committed, they can easily get a warrant, and that warrant can be used to decrypt the video surveillance that they are seeking. But by encrypting the video feed, what you gain is people can rest assured that this information is not going to be used for unauthorized surveillance purposes. The Peel Police Board have already passed the motion saying it wants to work with the province to get approval and funding for the project. The province says they are still waiting for a formal request from the police board. If you have the evacuation notice and you're listening to me right now and you're still in your home, leave. California is under a statewide emergency as growing wildfires rage. They have now forced almost 200,000 people from their homes. Power outages to prevent more fires have also left 3 million people in the dark. CNN's Connor Powell is live in Los Angeles County for us tonight. And Connor, let's start with the latest from where you are, sir. Yeah, the latest is that the winds, uh, winds have calmed down significantly here. This uh, fire uh, has uh, charred about 600 or so acres. We know, if you look behind me, there's about eight houses in this area that have been almost completely destroyed. You can see this one has just been totally gutted here. Uh, everything has gone out of this house. There's about eight houses right now that we know uh, that are like this. A couple more that have been damaged. The winds are significantly less now than what they were earlier this morning. And earlier this morning, it was really the winds that propelled this fire across the western part of the city. Uh, people in this area got a phone call, a text, a knock on their door about 1, 2 o'clock or so in the morning telling them they needed to get out now. The fire was spreading. A lot of damage to the hillsides, to the canyon in this area, but little damage right now so far to the buildings in this entire area. That's the good thing. Right now the wind is calm and a lot of the wind that is coming in here is coming from the ocean. That's a cooler wind. It has a lot more uh, humidity, so it's, uh, it's not as dry a wind. And that's really what firefighters are hoping will be the, the wind for the next 24 hours or so. If the wind stays calm and if the wind is coming from the ocean, that gives them a real shot to get this fire under control. Uh, right now it is not under control by any means, but they have been working on it with uh, uh, helicopters and planes dumping water and other chemicals. Uh, so they've really been hitting this hard all day, in large part because there are so many houses and people that are affected by this area. Um, but it's far from over right now, Dwight. Talk about the conditions there, Connor. Let's talk about the people now. Thousands have been forced to flee from these fires. Hundreds of thousands more are living without power. How are people holding up through all of this? Yeah, you've got two issues here right now. You've got uh, tens of thousands that have been forced out of their homes. Everyone from LeBron James to Arnold Schwarzenegger are people that were forced out of their homes earlier this morning. Uh, there's a lot of celebrities that live in this part of Los Angeles, a lot of very big, expensive homes. But there's a lot of just regular homes as well, and everybody in this area has been forced uh, to find other uh, places. The Red Cross, of course, has set up shelters in uh, surrounding areas. A lot of people have fled to other parts of the city where there is not the threat of fire. Um, you know, power is a big issue here. There are thousands of people across uh, the, the city of Los Angeles and across the entire state, maybe as many as 600,000 people that might be without power. In large part, that's because the two big power companies here, uh, Con Edison and um, uh, PG&E, they have shut off power because of the fear of those winds knocking down power lines and starting fires. That's something we've here, uh, we've seen here uh, the last couple of years with, uh, with this type of fire season. That's the big concern. So people have had to get out of their houses, and the people who are in their houses, many of them are under... Uh, uh, I have no electricity at home right now, Dwight. CNN's Connor Powell joining us from Los Angeles County tonight. Thank you, Connor.
in college. You hear Connor talk about the winds down there. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you've been to Cali many times. You see how those winds are, they're jumping highways, jumping areas. It's just a really bad situation down there right now. It is horrific, Dwight. You're quite right about that. And, you know, I was just in the state this time last week, in fact, and those Santa Anas, those winds were about to kick in. And my colleagues, some of the meteorologists there were just bracing. They could forecast it, but they knew you just cannot control it. October is a very scary month in that state because seven of the deadliest or the three of the deadliest and seven of the worst fires they've ever seen there in that state have come in this month because it's a lack of rain that they see of course and also because of those winds and in the north by the way they call them not the santa anas the diablo winds and you can understand that as well so they just spread those wildfires very very hard to control well we're seeing some heat here not like that of course but the temperatures are going to be rising as we go into tomorrow these are the current readings we had just a glorious day today in terms of seeing some mid to approaching upper teens. Well, tomorrow it gets even warmer. We'll get to that in just a moment. I do want to let you know, though, because we have some of this heat and then we cool down a little bit at night or the surface is a little bit cooler here, we'll likely see a bit of patchy fog uh, here and there. So some reduced visibility, that potential is there. We start off pretty nicely tomorrow. Clouds will be on the increase. And by the time we get into the afternoon hours, we may see a few isolated showers, particularly to the north of the GTA and to the west but the southwesterly winds are going to pick those readings up so after a mild overnight of eight it's 18 tomorrow dwight and then big changes are coming and i mean big so i've got to tell you all about that that's coming up oh we'll check back with you 18 wow thank you colette you're welcome a licensed hemp farmer says td bank froze his business accounts and accused him of engaging in illegal activity he says he'd been provided his bank with his business and hemp licenses and had never been flagged by the bank before but as John Lancaster reports in this exclusive story, the farmer believes he was flagged because of the way he looked. Akeem Gardner harvests hundreds of acres of industrial hemp, which he sells to companies who make plant-based textiles, foods, and building materials. But the operation ground to a halt earlier this month when TD Bank froze his business account after he asked the bank to transfer $35,000 to a vendor to pay for equipment. I was incorrectly flagged as someone who was doing um, illicit business. They told me that they were shutting down my account and they weren't going to let me operate anymore because I was running a business that the bank didn't support. Gardner says he provided the bank with his Health Canada hemp license when he applied for his business account almost a year ago and says he previously moved money at the bank with no issues. But in those prior visits, he'd usually worn business clothes. This time I went in with my hoodie and my toucan and obviously a 6'4 black guy, right? TD won't say why Gardner's account and credit card were frozen, only that the transaction was flagged. It does concede there was a, quote, misunderstanding about Gardner's business. A misunderstanding, Gardner says, that's cost him time and money. Because TD froze my credit card, so everyone who I was, um, was charging my credit card account, like my farm insurance and so on and so forth, they all got declined. TD Bank says it continues to investigate what happened. As for Gardner, he's moved his money to another bank. A lot of these um, assumptions are made when it comes to minorities that are trying to do good work or legal work in this industry. And that's what was um, shocking to me about this. John Lancaster, CBC News, Orangeville, Ontario. I feel like it might not intentionally be directed at us, but for sure young people like us do see it a lot. They're just targeting the youth, and I don't think that's good for us. Days after the province announced it would ban vaping ads at gas stations and corner stores, Union Station is plastered with them. Coming up, we ask transit riders whether it's a good idea, and we also hear from the TTC. Stay with us. The weather update is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train.
U.S. President Donald Trump won't be singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game anytime soon. He received a chilly reception Sunday night at the World Series game in Washington. A bit of an awkward moment there. The boos began after a tribute to U.S. service members and the president appeared on screen. He and the first lady sat in a suite at Nationals Park. At times, they waved to the crowd and smiled for photos. But later in the evening, fans started up a course of lock him up. President Trump also announced yesterday the U.S. had killed the leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. The, pen the Pentagon, rather, is revealing new information about the mission in Syria that led to the death. But the U.S. Secretary of Defense says the fight against the militant group is ongoing, and so is the withdrawal of U.S. troops from that region. The CBC's Arthi Pohl has more now from Washington. It was a tremendous weekend for our country. The U.S. president in Chicago today once again gloated over the U.S. military success over the weekend, the death of the ISIS founder and leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He was a sick and depraved man, and now he's dead. He's dead. He's dead as a doornail. And he didn't die bravely either, I will tell you that. Trump repeating his allegation that the ISIS leader was whimpering as he neared death, something the Pentagon could not confirm today. But Trump's defense secretary made it clear al-Baghdadi's killing is a significant blow against the terror group. However, the fight against ISIS is far from over. Baghdadi's death will not rid the world of terrorism or end the ongoing conflict in Syria. But it will certainly send a message to those who would question America's resolve and provide a warning to terrorists who think they can hide. Two men detained during the mission are currently in U.S. custody. No doubt they will be mined for information on what the terror group might be planning next. Other evidence was also seized from the compound, and experts say some of the key intelligence that will be gathered now is information on any current plots, details on how the organization is working, communicating, and funding itself. Also, who is the successor and how do they operate in the organization, along with any information they can find on big strategic plans? Despite this development, U.S. officials maintain there will be a withdrawal of U.S. troops in the region who had been fighting alongside Kurdish-led forces to combat ISIS. Turkey and Russia are now moving in to police northern Syria and the surrounding area where the ISIS threat is greatest. But U.S. forces say part of their efforts to contain the terror group will include troops being stationed to protect oil fields. These oil fields provided ISIS with the bulk of financial resources used to fund its terror. U.S. troops will remain positioned in this strategic area to deny ISIS access those vital, to those vital resources. Experts say retaliation by ISIS is likely and that all forces in the region should remain vigilant. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Washington. After a 14-year-old boy was killed outside of his own school, Hamilton's public school board is taking steps to address bullying. I'm Angelina King. I'll have more on what the board is discussing and how a mother who lost her son is reacting to the ideas. That's coming up.
Hamilton's public school board is taking steps to address bullying after a 14-year-old was stabbed to death in front of his mother outside his school. Tonight, the board will consider implementing a bullying review panel to address concerns in the community. Angelina King joins us live from the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. And Angelina, what more can you tell us about this plan? So the panel would be made up of three community leaders, people who have expertise in equity, mental health, and how a school board works. So they would go out and meet with different people, uh, experts, parents, students, staff, and then come back to the school board with recommendations on how to properly deal with bullying, how to prevent it, how to intervene, and how to report it. Now, this all comes after 14-year-old Devin Bracky Selvi was stabbed to death outside of his own school earlier this month. His mother has told us that he was bullied relentlessly and that he that the family had talked to the school about what was going on. We were able to speak with her earlier today uh, about what her thoughts are on this proposal. She says that it's not enough to combat bullying alone, but she says she's being open minded about the idea. She's actually here at the meeting tonight saying she wants to ensure that this plan does go forward. Parents, the school, the police, all of us have to come together as one unit to keep them safe. And if we don't have that, that whole connection, then this happens. The last few weeks have been absolute hell. And I just, I just so wish he was still here. Now, this plan would also take a look at how the board currently deals with bullying. A CBC investigation found inconsistencies when it came to the board reporting violent incidents to the education ministry. The education director here has acknowledged that, and the board chair said tonight that this review is all about doing better. The concept itself is often portrayed simply but as educators, we know the solution is far more complex. We know it often starts in our schools, and we need to do more to protect and support our children. That is what the panel will be tackling in the coming months. So the board is discussing this proposal right now. If it is approved, then the panel is expected to have a report back to the school board by the end of May. Dwight? Angelina, thank you. You may have seen them while passing through Union Station today. New ads for vaping companies were put up. This comes after the province banned such ads at convenience stores and gas stations last week. But as Greg Ross explains, there's nothing stopping these companies from advertising in other areas. From the second you step off the subway and onto the platform at Union Station, it's hard not to notice the ads. For sure, young people. I guess do see it a lot like it can still influence us yeah. in some way. 16 year old Nina Shapiro saw the ads on her way to school with her friends today. The ads are for a company called Vipe, which is owned by Imperial Tobacco. They say things like, Our e liquids are rigorously assessed by our team of experts. They're making it seem like it's okay. And that's the problem, according to Robert Schwartz, a professor at U of T's Dalai Lama School of Public Health. He says the ads ignore the fact that there has been a rise in illness related to vaping in recent months, particularly in the U.S. Any kind of advertising is going to uh, entice kids to use it. So advertising and promotion have to be completely banned. But the TTC says it's bound by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms on free speech. In the absence of uh, a federal ban on that advertising, as you have with tobacco, uh, there's very little we can do to, to, to uh, restrict the advertising or to decline it. Stuart Green says riders have expressed concerns, which is why the TTC Board of Governors is considering an appeal to the federal government to step in, despite the lucrative contract they have with Imperial Tobacco. The value is about a half million dollars uh, in advertising on the TTC in the last year. The federal government did pass a law to prevent companies from specifically targeting children in vaping ads, but Toronto MP Adam Vaughn says it may be time to review it. The risk is, is getting better understood, and as the risk is better understood, my guess is the regulations will keep pace with tobacco. We reached out to Imperial Tobacco. They say their ads are intended for adults looking for an alternative to smoking, and while they maintain their products are less harmful than cigarettes, they don't suggest vaping products are harmless. They also don't believe vaping should be regulated the same way as tobacco. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. 
Hundreds of new housing and rental units are slated for the Queen East neighborhood. But unlike many new developments in our city, this one will include affordable housing spaces and designated rental units. Alicia Hassan has the details. It's about creating a new community where renters and TCHC tenants and condo owners live side by side. The plan is to demolish the two 60-year-old buildings at the site and replace them with brand new ones, creating a more mixed-income community. The new buildings will have 120 rent geared to income units and 100 affordable units. There will be 180 apartments available at market rent, as well as 350 condo-style units and 16,000 square feet of retail space. The tenants currently living in the two buildings will be relocated to suitable accommodation at other TCHC properties. All eligible tenants will have the right to move into the new development once completed, and the ETA on that is 2023. Current tenant Dion Samuel says the temporary inconvenience will be worth it. The fact that we're getting um, a new community that we can be proud of and a new community that we can take care of and, and hopefully thrive over the next, I don't know, 20 years or so, that would be great. Thank you. From the, all the community and all the tenants, we're really happy that this is going to take place. Overall, the Toronto Community Housing Corporation faces a $1.6 billion backlog of repairs to its crumbling infrastructure. This $300 million development will be done at no cost to the city. A Toronto-based development company is footing the whole bill, and they're able to do that by leveraging the land value. That there's enough value for a private developer to say I can create all this and <laughs> and not go bankrupt in the process. In the coming weeks Toronto community housing officials will be visiting all of the tenants and discussing their options. They hope to have everybody relocated by the end of summer 2020 to allow for demolition to begin. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Oh, we've been waiting to get back to weather because call it Kennedy's talking about temperatures, 18, did you say? Like almost 20 out there? <laughs> yeah, 18 degrees. And at this time of year, Dwight, you know, seasonal is 11. So it, it, book your tea time, uh, whatever it is you want to be doing tomorrow, if you can. Uh, it's going to be a day to take advantage of. And you're going to be glad you did once we get a little deeper into this week and you see some of the weather conditions we're going to have. I do want to point something out for you here on the Almanac. Okay, so the record snow for the state in history comes from 1965. But did you know the record snow for yesterday, it's two centimeters, it's not a significant amount, but it comes from last year. Yeah, at this time last year, we were having some light snow, not just yesterday, it carried on into the 28th as well and we had another almost half centimeter today so two and a half nearly uh, total and, and instead we're getting sunshine gorgeous day today and tomorrow gets even better in terms of those temperatures getting even warmer we're still sitting at 13 degrees so it's a very nice evening in the overnight tonight though because we do have some of this warmer air in place and things are a little cooler at the surface we may start to see some fog developing it'll be somewhat patchy in nature but again our winds aren't very strong either and so without that kind of mixing of the atmosphere that allows that development so even tomorrow morning there may be a few areas with some reduced visibility for the morning commute just a few areas then we get into a situation where we have more sunshine early in the day then the clouds will be thickening up into the afternoon and later afternoon evening now into cottage country we will see some showers developing but some isolated showers may work their way down towards the gta I think they will primarily stay west of us and stay to the north of us though. And then things kind of dry out with the system, that system, as it passes through. Whole different story as we get into the next one coming in that's gonna have an impact Wednesday, Thursday, even into Friday. So Wednesday, part of the day should be dry. Then we get into later in the day, some more significant rain pushing in and coming on in towards Thursday to Halloween. And I wanna show you Thursday into Friday, how some of these winds are not too bad for evening trick or treat hours, but it looks like into Friday morning, we could have some of those winds 70, 75, even 80, 85 kilometers an hour, some of those gusts. So something to be really concerned about for Friday morning. Don't be too concerned tonight though. We're talking about mild overnight temperatures and beautiful, beautiful temperatures for tomorrow afternoon. It's after that that things really cool down and we'll be really watching that Halloween forecast, Dwight. So we'll keep, you know, tweaking that as we get a little closer to it this week. I have to wear shorts tomorrow. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> yes, you do that. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> Not on there.
A pedestrian safety group launched Toronto's first ever school street this morning. The initiative turned a street near High Park into a car-free zone during drop-off and pickup times today and made Monday morning a little more fun for the youngsters. Linda Ward was there. Ready? One, two, three, go! All right, they've shut this road down. Kids are playing with toys right in the middle of Mount View Avenue in front of Keel Street Public School. It's part of a demonstration by 880 cities to demonstrate why children should be able to play in the road outside the school, have a safe place to go. Now, this is one of three demonstrations over the last few months by this organization that aims to make streets safer here in the city of Toronto. Here's the group's executive director director on why they're taking action like this today. The start of the story is actually begins with tragedy. Someone um, approached us, a private donor who actually lost someone close to her to road violence. She wanted to put uh, a donation towards raising awareness about this important issue and demonstrate the importance of street design uh, to actually improve safety. And the kids here are certainly having fun with this. Now this road is going to be closed for one hour at drop off this morning, one hour at pick up in the afternoon. It's going to be like this until Thursday, Halloween. We have toys out here today for the kids to play with. Now, Lotus, you are a member of the school's eco team. So why is this so important to you? Because everybody Everybody gets to play, there's no cars disrupting everybody and um, everybody's enjoying themselves and not like when cars come down the streets and you just have to rush to the schoolyard. What do you think of all the kids that are out here today having a good time? Everybody looks very happy or like excited or smiling. I can see a lot of smiling faces. So the group says that this not only reduces pollution and the chance for pedestrian collisions, but it also decreases the stress that parents have at drop off and pick up and it encourages physical activity for kids. And you can see behind me, these kids are having a whole lot of fun on their way into school this morning. Linda Ward, CBC News, Toronto. As we head to break, here's a look at where the markets close today. Stay with us, we will be right back.
Some bad news for hundreds of workers at a Ford Motor Company plant in Oakville. The company announced 450 workers will be laid off in the new year. Well, it's never a good time to get laid off, but we're coming into the holiday season, which is certainly uh, uh, a little bit more troubling for our members, but it's going to devastate uh, the communities uh, uh, in and around the Oakville plant, so it's devastating news. There's no doubt about it for our junior members. The plant is stopping production of its Ford Flex and Lincoln MKT models. They have seen slumping sales in recent years. The layoffs are in addition to 200 job cuts in July. Notices will be sent out to the most junior employees at the facility in early November. The positions will officially be cut starting in February. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's attempt at an early election in the UK was voted down in Parliament today, but Johnson is still vowing to hold a nationwide vote in December. He's trying to win a majority so he can make it easier to push his unpopular Brexit deal through the House of Commons. Rene Filipponi explains. The eyes have it, but the motion has not obtained the majority required. It was a defeat Prime Minister Boris Johnson was expecting. MPs voted down his plan for a snap election on December 12th. Now, he needed a two-thirds majority to force an election, but the Labour Party wouldn't support his move. Now, Johnson believes if the UK goes to the polls now, his government will win a majority. Then he would be able to break the Brexit deadlock and get out of the EU as soon as possible. Tonight, he is saying he will try again tomorrow with a simple bill that would only need a simple majority. We will not allow this paralysis to continue, and one way or another, we must proceed straight to an election. The Liberal Democrats and members of the Scottish National Party are also planning to table a bill tomorrow asking for an election on December 9th. For them, it's about stopping Brexit. And a Liberal Democrat government would revoke Article 50 on day one, and that is the best way to stop this opposition move was contingent on the EU granting a Brexit extension, which they confirmed today. And it's being described as a flex extension, and that means if the UK can ratify the withdrawal agreement sooner, it could leave the EU before the deadline. But through this all, EU leaders have been clear they want to avoid a no-deal scenario, but the ball is in the UK's court now. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. I'm past patiently waiting, I'm passionately smashing every expectation, every action's an act of creation. I'm laughing in the face of casualties and sorrow. For the first time, I'm thinking past tomorrow. The wait is over for fans of the smash hit musical, Hamilton. It's beginning a run at the Ed Mervis Theatre here in Toronto next February. Tickets went on sale this morning. After the break, we'll take you outside the theatre where fans are lined up. Stay with us.
Some of the award-winning sounds of the hit musical Hamilton. Tickets went on sale this morning for its Toronto run. Yelena Adzik was out as people lined up to get tickets this morning. And Yelena, it appears there's plenty of excitement yes. about the show finally coming to Canada. So excitement enough to get people out there around 5.30, 5.45 this morning. Yeah, it was a little bit early. I was with them. Uh, <laughs> so the interesting thing that they did this year, why don't I give you a look at the crowd so I can talk a little bit more about the interesting setup, okay? Because what they did, Dwight, is just because you got there first in line did not actually mean you get first dibs at the tickets. Okay. It was unconventional. You were put into a group with some first people in line and then the next 10 would be put in a group and so on and so on. And then if your group number got called, you got to come up and buy tickets. They were actually rolling, spinning one of those strange spinners for oh, a lottery no. number uh, to be pulled out. And the main point of all of this kind of a cumbersome approach is to try and deter scalpers Got because it. scalpers are not going to do that kind of thing. That woman that you just saw there cheering, she was the very first in line and she did end up getting in and getting some tickets. So it was really interesting to uh, see the, the range in the crowd. There was a lot of, uh, you know, different ages, different backgrounds. I'm going to give you a listen right now to just two of the people that I spoke with in line. I left home about 5 o'clock this morning. I got here maybe, you know, 20 to 6 or whatever. I don't even like musicals. I don't even like singing. But I really do like this one, the rap musical about the value of the U.S. All right, there you go. And you saw quite a mix in the crowd in terms of ages and backgrounds. So that was interesting to see, too. Yeah, she doesn't like singing. <laughs> no, we all like singing. Okay, tickets, <laughs> $200 a pop. Yeah. That's kind of high for our musical theater. It's not Broadway over there. We love it, but that's a little high. It, it's, it's on the high side for sure. Now, people that were in line who are theater lovers, they will say, oh, isn't that a bargain? They actually thought it was pretty good because if you think about it, if you paid to go see it at Broadway, Ooh. you're paying for accommodations, <laughs> the tickets are more expensive, and you're paying yes. for the flight too. So for a lot of people, this was actually kind of in the reasonable-ish yes, territory. Yeah. Now, listen, for some people, it's really the fact that they don't get to see a musical like this uh, normally at all because the story that we're talking about when you think Hamilton this was a man who was an immigrant from the West Indies mm -hmm. and he ends up being George Washington's right-hand man and then later the Treasury Sec Secretary of Treasury and so this is a story that's unconventional and then the fact that you've got rapping in there have a listen to this woman she just said it really resonated with her like how he uses um, like people of color he makes sure to have visible minorities play uh, key roles um, because you know most of history is it's you know Caucasian people so it's nice to see like Asians and um, African Americans and everybody be able to play roles that typically like wouldn't be quote unquote for them so she just really appreciated that it felt like something she could relate to so that's what we're hearing too and she's willing to pay the 200 I have the soundtrack. I, I want to see this. You're really going to do it? Too. I want to see it? it so badly. Thanks, Yelena. See you soon. Yeah, I want to see this one. <laughs> okay, chilly tonight, but you won't believe the day Mother Nature has in store for you tomorrow. We're on that after the break.
A new path tucked behind the University of Toronto Scarborough campus was made with all students in mind. The Valleyland Trail is half a kilometer long and slopes down 19 meters, and it's also fully accessible. We explored the new trail today with the school's director of accessibility services and saw firsthand how it will make a difference. It's nice to be in nature smelling the, the leaves and the grass and the, the forest. There's a specific sm smell that nature has that you know, I don't get to experience very much. The University of Toronto Scarborough is a very large property. We have 125 acres where students just never made it to. Um, and so we wanted to improve accessibility for our student community. It's a significant drop so that um, they really weaved it within the trees and in between the trees. And that helped maintain a, a, a slope that's more reasonable. We actually walked this trail many times before it was here, identified key tree species, um, animal migration patterns, and then designed the trail around all of those key orientations. And what we've got left now is a trail that doesn't interfere with uh, migration patterns and really creates a spectacular place for both the human inhabitants of the space but also the, the wild animals that live in this area as well. It was important that we have round handrails so that people using them, it helps them guide them but also to, to hold on to. We also have a battery charger halfway up the trail so that if somebody needed to charge the mobility device, um, they can um, stop and we have them be able to pull off the path. Uh, there's spots for seating um, where people can transfer where there's a backrest. We also have classrooms down here and our students with disabilities haven't been able to participate in the same way we've had to be creative over the years and in, in how they get included in, the, in this type of classroom where they're coming down and tagging trees for example it's really about inclusion and ensuring that everybody can experience and participate in our, our learning environment and, and social environment well, I came down here in the 80s <laughs> Although once I was able to walk down here, um, otherwise I haven't been as a staff member down in the valley. It's really exciting to be a part of it, to be down here. I'm not just saying that because I work here. <laughs> it is, uh, it's, it makes such a difference to our community. It really mm. does. It took us a long time to get that there, but like it's so worth it and so easy to do. So. Let's support that. And tomorrow with those 18 degrees will be the oh, perfect day to, be to there. take a stroll oh, at that leaves, spot behind the, the UOT Scarborough there. campus. Yeah. Oh, with the deer, my moment of zen <laughs> right there. I know, we were like, ah, oh, yeah. nice way to end the show. And you can have a nice moment of zen, or at least I hope you can take an opportunity to have one outside tomorrow and, and just enjoy the fact that we're headed to a high of 18 degrees. Now, some patchy fog tonight. Could be some lingering patches early tomorrow morning, so a few spots with some reduced visibility for your commute tomorrow morning. But otherwise, yes, we will see increasing cloudiness and some isolated afternoon showers, especially north and northwest. But... 18 oh, degrees. It's beautiful. Yeah. God, your most popular yeah. person in the newsroom again. I won't, I won't be after tomorrow. <laughs> That's it for us <laughs> tonight. You Thank you for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.